So last week we covered um, all of chapter three, <laughs> unbeknownst to my calendar over here <laughs> on the wall. Uh, and now we're going to jump into thinking about part of speech tagging. Okay. And so this is a critical component for any NLP project that um, requires parts of speech, like all the parsing that we'll cover at the end of the semester, and for some um, uh, classification that we might do, and that's the next chapter. So we're slowly moving up to what people would traditionally think of as sentiment. That's really chapter six. And then chapter seven and eight, we're going to cover um, how to write your own grammars. And so clearly part of speech is important for that. So everything we've done so far, talking about different corpora, is now leading to what can we do with those corpora. And so here's where we're going to start. Um, but just kind of the thought process, if I'm going to write a program that reads parts of speech, um, what even are the parts of speech that I can use? Right, so we've got nouns, uh, this is your basic uh, meaning-based section for speech, uh, adjectives, adverbs, and verbs, these top are the top four types of parts of speech that lead us to understanding what's going on. Uh, Pronouns, which are noun replacements, determinants, which are the worker words, prepositions, conjunctions, and there's even more. Okay. Um, and so when we get into tagging here, we're going to build a supervised system. So this is supervised learning. We're going to take words and classify them into their part of speech. And generally, this is just called tagging. Okay, so we're going to talk about tagging, chunking, parsing, classifying. Yeah, I covered them all. Uh, and so just know that those each are different things that I might try and do uh, depending on my goal. So I might tag first and then chunk. Um, and so a tag set is a collection of tags. We're mostly going to use the brown corpus. It's been long treated as a gold standard, even though maybe it's not the best one we should use. It's definitely the easiest one to use. Um, and then there's other ones like the pen tree bank corpus, and there's a couple of newer ones. Um, and so we're going mean, to basically teach you how to tag text automatically in a couple of different ways. Okay. And so there's a key problem here that this idea will repeat across the semester is that words are not often only one part of speech. Um, so you can have a single word uh, that can be multiple parts of speech. And sometimes words are up to like 10 parts of speech. The word that is a great example because it can be a bunch of different types of parts of speech. Um, but even some nouns can be nouns or verbs. So uh, that kind of ambiguity can cause us issues. Um, so in NLTK, there's a function already built in that's based on the concepts that we're going to talk about building our own. But it's called POS tag, so for part of speech tagging. And it'll tag a word tokenized object. Okay. And so you have to have a list of words to make this work. Okay. And so if I use the function of POS tag and I put in my list of words, it might show me output like DT for determinant, NN for noun, VBZ for like a past tense verb. So verbs are often also categorized by their tense, and JJ for adjective. Okay. However, this set of uh, labels is not consistent across corpora, um, and so we can use a universal tag set that's built into NLTK, or we can use the tag set that comes with the corpus. Okay. And those will give you different results, so that's, it's important to understand which tag set to use. So let's play with one here. If I import NLTK and import word tokenize function, what I will get is the ability to put this into individual word units. We talked last week about how that can be hard if you are writing your own with regular expressions. And then if I use POS tag, what I get is D is a determinant, dog is a noun, is is a verb, and sleepy is uh, an adjective. Uh, and then that becomes handy if you're trying to classify um, or you're trying to do entailment where you're trying to say out what is sleepy, what's the dog, 
you're trying to build maybe a chat box system where you have grammatical sentences. So understanding part of speech helps us do many, many NLP projects. So here's a fun sentence. They refuse to permit us to obtain the refuse permit. Okay. So basically, they won't give us the garbage permit. Okay. And the nice thing is, is that it understands the difference in context of um, refuse here as a verb, a present tense verb, and refuse here as a noun, or meaning garbage. And so a lot of our, the built-in taggers are, have been trained and tested so many times that they have a good grasp on what the options are around it determines if it's a verb or a noun. Okay. So here, this version should be noun instead of verb. Okay. The permit here is a verb, but the permit here is a noun. And that's really based on tree structure, which we'll get to in chapters 7, 8, and uh, if we get to 9, 9 as well. And so if you're not sure how the function works, you can remember you can use help. Um, and the help here kind of, uh, well, I thought it would let me scroll, but it's being rude, um, kind of gives you some different examples of the way it's used. Um, and mainly it just uses word tokenize and um, creates those tokens and then explains later how it does them. And so it has a list later that you can look at. So, ah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, it will also, depending on what language you want to pick, so you can use the ISO code. Okay. Um, there are different ISO codes. These are the three letter codes and not the two letter codes that we used last week. Um, it does use, uh, it has been trained on a universal tag set with uh, the Wall Street Journal and Brown. So this has got some different options that one can use. Uh, and this will make a little bit more sense once we uh, write our own what, what's actually happening in the background. Okay. It does return a list of tuples. So that's what it tells us here. That's the, na the, the word and the part of speech. So why would it do this? Um, it has so many applications, but generally it's thinking about, we can think about similarity. So words that are the same part of speech are more likely to be similar. Right? Nouns match nouns, adjectives match na adjectives. Um, if we're trying to create a predictive grammar, what word should come next? Okay, let's say you're trying to write something like Siri or Google search, um, knowing what part of speech is before it tells you what part of speech can come next. Because there are certain rules about the order of parts of speech. Okay. Most languages are subject, verb, object, okay, about 75%, or subject, object, verb, okay, a couple of your European languages. Uh, but either way, that implies that there's a noun phrase, so some sort of sets of nouns, a verb phrase, some, some, some sort of verb, and potentially one more noun phrase that has some more nouns. So if I got noun and then a verb, the next thing that's coming is probably a noun or some sort of phrase with a noun in it. All right. So what we're going to do is take the entire brown corpus. And just a quick reminder about loops here. So from the uh, brown corpus, pull the words. Remember, dot words implies that we're just pulling all the individual words from brown. Uh, loop over those words and just make them lowercase so that everything is consistent in the same case and just save that as text. So text is a giant list of all of the words from the brown corpus. I could think about this, what is similar to woman? Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, and check out what the most similar words are. The first one is man. Uh, time, day, year, car, moment, all of these are nouns, right? House, family, state, place. Uh, way is a weird word. It can be either, but often it's a noun. Uh, word, girl, work, word. Okay. War, girl, work, word. <laughs> Can't read. So mostly it's nouns. Okay. If we look at what's similar to bot, we generally get verbs. Made, said, done, put, seen, found. Okay. <clears throat> If we print out what's similar to a determinant, we tend to get other determinants and that 
Uh, and then some pr pronouns, this, there. Um, and so generally, this is just proof of concept that words that are similar to other words are usually the same part of speech. Okay. So knowing part of speech can tell me similarity. Knowing part of speech can allow me to build my own um, uh, chat box. Okay. All right, so playing with the tagged corpora, uh, and this is something we've talked about before, but just remember that a tuple is a sequence of immutable. Remember, immutable means not changeable objects. So once you've built the tuple, you can't reach in and change it. You can overwrite it, but you can't change the internal structure of it. And so a tuple is some sort of combination of stuff. Okay. And you see them here in the parentheses. Um, it doesn't have to be two. It can be more than two. Uh, the common thing that we're going to do is use two. Uh, but remember that these are the normal parentheses. A list is a sequence of changeable objects, and those are the square brackets. So I could put a list of tuples, okay? and I can overwrite one of the tuples, the entire set, but I can't overwrite the internal components of a tuple. And so most tagged corpus sets are tuples. Uh, generally, it's often in the format of word part of speech, uh, meaning they sometimes are printed as the text itself, slash, and then the part of speech. So there's this cute little function that's um, kind of structured to tuple, or string to tuple, that makes it into the, the useful tuple set. Okay. This would be really uncommon for you to do. Uh, unless you had a data set that had not that had that had this sort of structure that had never been processed properly. Okay. So this will help you if you have sort of a new data set. So here's what Brown actually looks like. We've played with the Brown corpus a little bit, but here here's the actual if you print out the text, the, the raw text, here's what it looks like. Um, now, if you do dot, you know, NLTK dot corpus dot brown dot bra, you'll actually just get all of the words. But the act, the underlying text files that are brown look like this. Okay. And so what we see is we see V is an um, AT. This is their code for determinant. Okay. Uh, Fulton is a proper noun. County is uh, another noun. Uh, grand jury, this is an adjective to noun, said as a past tense verb. Uh, Z is present tense, I got that backwards a second ago. Friday is a noun. Uh, Anne is in a determinant, so it's got each one in here. You'll notice that they've got special codes for prep, um, possessiveness. And almost any uh, punctuation is just sort of left as the label for the punctuation. But on this page alone, you can see how many different uh, tags there are for the parts of speech. Um, and instead of just pulling this as is and then having to do this tuple structure thing, uh, they've already built this in. So the tagged words function uh, pulls out a list of tuples. So that's really handy. Um, they also have tagged sentences, which is a, a, a special type of, it's like a list of a list of tuples. Um, but tagged words is really great. So now we have uh, each word and its pair kind of nicely tupled together. Now, the issue here is that every corpus uses a slightly different tag set, which is awesome because we've got a lot of different options, but also annoying because now I have to figure out how to compare, you know, the, the Penn Tree Bank corpus to the Brown corpus or the Wall Street Journal or the NPS chat corpus to Brown um, or any of them, of them to each other. Okay. And so having to um, parse these can be difficult. So instead, what we can do is convert everything into a common tag set. Okay. Uh, and so that's tag set equals universal. And these are much easier to read. Let's look at them. Okay. Uh, there's 10 in the universal tag set, which is a pretty good representation of, of English. 
Now you do lose um, some granularity, like you don't know if the verbs are present tense or past tense, or just all verbs. So uh, the choice of tag set depends on the uh, question that you are, the thing you're trying to do. If you're interested in verb tense, I would not pick the universal tag set because it drops verb tense. So we've got noun for nouns, verb for verbs, very clear. Adjective is ADJ, adverbs is ADV. Now JJ and RB are really common abbreviations in linguistics for adjectives and adverbs. Prime for pronouns, DET for determinants and articles, that's why it's AT in the brown corpus. ADP is prepositions and postpositions. This is mostly your prepositions. Num for numbers, conjunctions, particles, and then punctuation marks, and then the bad boy that's like everything else. Okay. And this is generally abbreviations. <clears throat> you can pull some other languages. Um, if you download the entire NLTK resources and not just the book that we downloaded. And the um, other languages that are possible in NLTK, there are other packages that have more. Uh, Chinese, Hindi, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and Catalan. Okay. <clears throat> and it would be the same idea, nltk.corpus.indian.tag words. So it's really nice because there are some other than English. A lot of our resources, unfortunately, in NLTK are in English because of the developers. So let's start playing with this a little bit. Let's think about, can we understand kind of more about, about language itself by looking at these tag sets. So this first half of this lecture is really going to explore what's in the tag sets, what does that tell us about things that, that we can do later, and the second half will be building your own tagger. So I'm going to import brown, and this is why I made the joke that brown is the most overused corpus, because we're going to use it a lot. <laughs> um, we're going to pull out the tagged news data set. So categories is the news, tag sets universal. Um, we're going to create a frequency distribution. Remember that frequency distributions are just a count of all of the, here are going to be all of the tags. Um, so it's got the first thing is the tag and the second number is the count across the data set. And here I'm going to loop over and pull out the tag as I loop over the word tag combinations because I know it's a tuple and the little parentheses here aren't necessary but that helps you understand like I'm looping over tuples. I, here's what they are. It's the word and then the tag, okay, the part of speech. I want the part of speech and do that for all of my words in the news data set. Don't forget about the most common function. I feel like that was what a lot of people missed in the chapter two assignment was, um, you know, if you're printing out the most common options, don't forget there's a function that'll do that for you. Uh, don't just print them all. So. <clears throat> Here, what we can see is if I look at a data set that is, you know, news, hobby, science fiction, it's kind of a wide, broad range of different English writings, nouns are the vast majority of words. I'd probably have to tell you, I'd probably have to do like a set function to figure out how many words there are to convert this to proportions, but this is twice as many as verbs. So it's clear that uh, nouns are the most unique types, okay. followed by verbs, not too surprising, followed by prepositions. Okay. Determinants are really popular. This is the NA. Uh, the NA. This is like of, but, and to. Okay. Adjectives and adverbs. And this is really interesting because the, wor the words that do the meaning of the language, the semantics of it, are often the nouns, the verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. Um, there are subtle differences in the use of word like the versus a, but the, the serious work of the words happens in those four. Now, two of them are the most popular types of speech, but the other two are not. And so it's interesting that our worker words and our uh, 
punctuation. Okay, when I say worker words, I mean all of our function words. These are holding up the sentence. They've got the semantics of the sentence, and these are like keeping everything in place. Um, they're actually very popular. Okay? So you really need the uh, also conjunctions. You really need the um, the stop words right, or the the worker words to keep the sentence in line, so to speak. So they're almost as popular as verbs. Okay? And they're more popular than words that actually tell us something about nouns and verbs. Um, so we'll kind of explore a little bit on each of the big four um, to think about how can we write our own taggers. And nouns very particularly have their own slots. Okay? Nouns will often occur after a determinant okay? or after an adjective. Uh, or before a verb. Okay, so most sentences tend to go noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase. Okay. Embedded clauses and like compl complex sentences will get late to later, but that I basic idea holds. Noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase. Okay. In the noun phrase, generally what happens is there's a determinant um, and or an adjective. Then you get to the verb phrase, uh, which is a verb. Then the second noun phrase might be preposition, then a determinant, and or adjective, and another noun. So nouns have specific spots that go in in sentences. So if I know that like determinants are really easy, they don't change types. The word the is not changing. It's a determinant. So if I see the word the, more than likely the next word is going to be an adjective or a noun. Um, so we might use in or nn for noun. NP sometimes is used for noun proper. These are like proper names, special names. Um, sometimes it's NNP, so these vary. But if it's got a P on it, it usually means proper. Sometimes people use a dollar sign. Sometimes the dollar sign is for possessive. This is why the universal tag set is so handy. It's because people are wildly inconsistent when they've developed corpora. They're kind of all doing it in all these different places. And it really took this package some newer packages to um, say, you know, we should probably make these all the same. All right. So let's think about um, how often, what, essentially, like, am I right about this sentence structure? How, what is preceding a noun? Or here we might do what comes after a noun. But this is kind of a question of like what's around a specific type of word. So what I did was use that bigrams function to take my tagged data set, that's the you know the list of tuples. And remember that the bigrams function, uh, here we can just print this out. Um, oh, okay, just kidding, I can't print it like this. <laughs> But uh, I could loop over and print it. Um, anyway, so what that is is going to be like little mini lists of pairs of tuples. So now we've got the, the pairs of words, word one and word two, and then word two and word three, word three and word four, et cetera, and still tied together with their um, part of speech. Right? So what we're going to do is loop over that where an A-B combination um, and I'm giving these their own names. It could be word one, word two, so there's nothing special about A and B here. Um, is first word and second word. Okay. But within first word and second word, there's little tuples of word and part of speech. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm looping over A and B in my word tag pairs. I'm telling it to give me A, so I want the first word if the second word is a noun. Okay. So loop over my word tag pairs, give me the first word back if the second word's a noun, but I don't actually want the word. You remember this one here means I want the part of speech. Okay. So we're sorting out all the nouns, pulling out the part of speech of things that come before nouns. And we can manipulate this any way we want. We could look at what comes before a verb. We could look at what comes after a noun. If we wanted what's after a noun, we would do 
uh, if A1 is a noun, what is B1? Okay. So there's lots of ways to do this, but right now we're just looking at what comes before nouns. Okay, pretty simple question. Okay. I'm going to take that list of things that comes before a noun and just make a frequency distribution. And I printed that out. And what we see is that nouns come before nouns. And noun-noun pairs are pretty common when they're proper names. Like the Fulton County, that's a proper pair. Um, or um, if you're trying to say uh, a color printer. Okay, color sometimes in that case might be considered a noun, sometimes it's an adjective. Uh, but a lot of times noun-noun pairs happen. But not far behind is the determinant. So I said most noun phrases are determinants in the nouns or determinants adjectives nouns, and that's the next one in here is an adjective. Not quite as common as our preposition phrases. This is a little sneaky because this is the previous sentence. Um, what follows, uh, what, what comes before a noun? Well, the second noun might be in front of a verb phrase. It might be verb noun. Here's our common. And then the rest of these are pretty uncommon. Okay. So sometimes with conjunctions, sometimes with a number, very infrequently with an adverb because an adverb modifies a verb. All right. By knowing this, I could build a a artificial, like an artificially intelligent machine, or I could try. I don't think we could actually totally build one, but we could build something like Siri to respond to people's questions um, on, uh, let's say, you're working for a TV or an internet company and people can't figure out how to get their internet working. Uh, I, don't, I guess they wouldn't be doing a chat box because then their internet wouldn't be working. This is a bad example. But let's say you have some sort of chat box. Like, I love Ikea's. It's terrible. It's hilariously terrible. Um, let's see if they still have Ask Anna on here. They used to have this really amazing, like, Ask Anna, and they may have gotten rid of it, where you could um, get help and um, and talk to this little system, and it was just, like, terribly bad because it just, the way its responses didn't make a lot of sense. But if you were trying to write that sort of thing, you would need to know, well, like, okay, this word is a noun. What's most likely going to be the next word? Okay. Or what comes before nouns? Okay, so understanding this, like, basic concept of sentence structure allows us to do a lot more. Okay. Also with uh, translation, machine, machine, machine translation, excuse me, because it's not a direct one-to-one -one phrasing. <clears throat> now, let's think about verbs. What are the most common verbs in English? So what we'll do to do this question is we'll actually use tree bank, which is a much newer corpus than Brown. Okay. And I'm going to pull out a universal tag set list so I can just look at verb in general and I don't have to think about verb, past tense, verb, present tense, etc. Just pull me the verbs. Create a frequency distribution of those verbs. Okay. And then here, um, I am telling it to, I'm sorry, here we go, pull out all the words, create a frequency distribution of all the words, now let's find the verbs. Okay. Um, so with this frequency distribution, remember that we have uh, a list of the words themselves and their part of speech and then a count of that. So this particular frequency distribution Let's see if I can print this. I don't think it's a generator object. It's probably going to get really mad. It's really huge. Okay. Let's just do word most common. And let's just do um, five of them, just so we can see it. There it goes. Did it freeze? Let's look. Uh, oh, yes, it did freeze. 
Thank you. Try that again. Ta-da! Alright. So what I do is just print the most common. So what's actually happening in this frequency distribution, what we've been doing is normally one word or one object followed by uh, the count of those objects. But now what we're doing is actually getting a tuple of a tuple in the list, so this can get quite stacked. Um, let me ignore that one. So the most common word is the word the in the treatment corpus um, as a determinant, which doesn't really change categories. But that set, so it's a tuple and a tuple, right? That tuple is 4,000 times. And then this is also a tuple. Okay. If I ignore um, punctuation, what I get now is that the next most common word is of. Okay, so the of, a, and, to are really most popular. And I'll just leave that in there. Uh, what I want to do though is I don't want to see determinants of stuff. I'll just look at verbs here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say I want the word, okay, so zero, in my tuple set uh, so by tuple, I mean we're talking about how uh, the pair, so the, the first is the, the, how do I say this? In this tuple, right, what we've got is the word pair, word and tag, and then it's count. Okay? And so what I want here is just the word. So the zero here stands for give me this first slot of that internal tuple. This here is just a placeholder because I don't really care what this is. We could call it part of speech. It doesn't matter. Looping over the most common words, if the second slot is a verb. Okay. And what we see is the most common verbs is, said, was, are, be, has, have, will, says, and would. So most of these are the infinitives to be. Um, and auxiliary verbs like has and have that um, help us um, with other verbs like I have gone, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so these verbs aren't too surprising. They're, I don't want to call them worker verbs because they're worker words, but they are verbs that um, denote a state uh, and so we use them quite a lot. How many times um, do words appear that are multiple parts of speech? Uh, so I can create a conditional frequency distribution on those words from the Wall Street Journal. Okay. And we built the Wall Street Journal one a couple minutes ago, uh, over here. It's a tree bank corpus. Okay. And the conditional frequency distribution now is going to have each word um, by its part of speech. So the count is going to be words by their parts of speech. And if I just want to look at one of them, I could look at the word yield because I know the word yield is actually a verb and a noun. And it's a very ambiguous word because it is equally likely to be a verb or a noun. So we can begin to understand ambiguity and polysemy in words by looking at how often they occur in each type of speech which is really important for the part of speech tag set kind of rules because that prior frequency um, or prior probability is useful information. For the word yield, not so useful. <laughs> this is a slight, slight prior for verb, but it's almost equally likely to be a noun because there are yield signs right? and when you're driving. Um, Adjectives and adverbs are another part of the big four. So adjectives describe nouns, and they're usually directly in front of the noun to modify it, like a large pizza, or in a predicate. Right? We have noun phrase. Now this is actually an implied noun phrase. When you say something like the pizza is large, you've got noun phrase, it's a determinate noun. A verb phrase of is for the verb, and then just an adjective. Um, and that implies that the, the, there's a noun phrase there that doesn't have a noun because that noun is referring back to the beginning. Okay. So these, um, these little, little types of sentences are actually a little complex to write in a sense because you're expecting another noun phrase and it's just an adjective because there's an implied noun. Okay. There's a missing noun.
cover that more in chapter eight, nine, eight, eight. Um, adify, adverbs, modify verbs, adverbs, modify verbs. Whew, talking is hard. <laughs> um, time, place, manner, direction. Okay. So we might say something like, I made notes slowly, I tried to read quickly. But adverbs in English are a little weird, and we've talked a little bit about how English is kind of an odd language. Every once in a while, adverbs don't do what they say. They modify, modify adjectives. Okay. And it's mostly the word really. Sorry. Um, really, literally. Okay. Uh, this is a word that has its own path in life <laughs> and can modify uh, nearly anything. Okay. So really is a really odd word. <laughs> so now I can start to play. I can figure out what is in this uh, corpus and what can I do with it. And this is really interesting when we get into collocates and thinking about if, let's say you want to, I'm, I'm always kind of interested in um, grammar, um, gender bias and grammar. So what people talk about when they talk about women and what they talk about when they talk about men. Um, you could also do this with hate speech. So there's lots of cool things here. But you pick a lexeme. A lexeme is an individual word. Okay. And look at the words that come with that lexeme. Okay. So sometimes these are called collocates. Remember, paired words, bigrams. Um, I can look at how often uh, cellar door, which is one of my friend's examples, um, occur together. Is that more frequent than any other combination of something and door? And it is. Um, and just think about like what is around that lexeme? Like, what do they get paired with? So peanut very often gets paired with butter. Okay. Butter less likely to be paired with peanut. Okay. So we're gonna pick a corpus, and we're just gonna pick the learned corpus just for fun. Okay. No particular reason other than to mix things up. Um, and here, what we've done is created bigrams. Hey, remember that's word one to word two, word two to word three, word three to word four, etc. And then looped over the pairs in the bigrams. There's no part of speech here at the moment. Um, pulled out the second word if the first word is often. Then we made it a set and we sorted it out better. So this is the second word after the first word is often. Okay. So often call, often called, carefully, enough, equate. So often it appears to be some, uh, an adverb because many of these are verbs. So this is how we might begin to guess at words that we've never seen. So if we have a word um, that is new to a, a, a tagger or a um, you're trying to figure out what some, a word means, like context clues. Often it's a noun. Best guess, if you don't know, it's a noun. Um, but you can look at what is most commonly paired with to also make that educated guess. So um, what I've done now is figured out what uh, words, types they're paired with. And I can look at this list. This is the literal word that they're paired with. You can see there are lots of verbs here. Um, so I can guess that often here is going to be an adverb. Um, and now instead of that, I can pull the tags. Okay. Let's stick with the universal corpus um, tag set because it's the easiest one to understand, personally. A same kind of loop. Pull the second word, part of speech. So this is a tuple set of double tuples here. Um, it's word one and it's part of speech, and word two and it's part of speech. So it's two pairs of uh, it's a tuple of two tuples. Um, so pull the second word's part of speech if the first word, this is zero here, is the word often. Then create a frequency distribution because those are just easier to work with. Count them up, print them out. I would definitely say that often is an adverb now because it is occurring right before a verb, okay. pretty strongly. And we can do this with any particular word. So let's say we're trying to determine what 
Um, let's put the word here. Cheese is my favorite word. So we can use that as an example. And in this tag set, it only occurs once in the learned tag set. That's part of my problem. Uh, before another noun. So let's see if I can pick another one. This is going to be the learned corpus. Book, maybe. Okay. So book's a noun. Uh, generally occurs before verb um, and with an article or preposition. I'm trying to think of a word that occurs a lot. Let's try the. That's going to be paired a lot with a noun because it's so determinate. So this is really handy if you don't know what a word is. Okay, like the corpus has or the the tagger has never seen it before. Let's play with the chat corpus. Now I like the chat corpus a lot because it's much more naturalistic speech. Unfortunately, the chat corpus is not arranged in such a way to use it as a trainer um, because it doesn't have tagged sentences, it only has tagged words, and we'll get more into that in the second half of this lecture. Um, but what we would do is pull all the words. Okay, so we're just going to jump in, we've got all these chat words. Let's create those bigrams again. We're going to loop over the pairs of tuples. Pull the second one. Oh, this is just words, I'm sorry. So no parts of speech yet. Um, loop over the pairs of words. Pull only the second one if the first one is the word you. And this is a really great list. So most of these are um, not conjunction, contractions, right? You would, you will, you are, you have. Um, but then it gets into a lot of other interesting pieces. Um, like people using what's uh, slang, different levels of dots and question marks, right? Um, and then other, lots of other words. It goes on for a while. Excuse me. So uh, now I know that you have comes with a lot of flavors. And let's see what types of words occur after you. Okay, you is a pronoun, which means it should act like a noun. And so what we would expect, without having already seen the results, is we would expect a lot of verbs to come next. Okay. Now, this is informal speech, so I might also expect a lot of nouns, because people might miss be spelling your. <laughs> so I pulled out all the tagged words this time. I looped over the pairs of tuples, so it's a Two tuple set. Pulled out the part of speech if the first word is you. Okay. Um, created a frequency distribution and printed out the top ten. Okay, now there are actually only ten um, parts of speech in the universal tag set, but if we actually decided to use their tag set, you would see more of these. So the NPS chat tag set has a bunch of other options. So we could see what are the most common uh, verbs, and it's present tense verbs. Oops. Put that back. There we go. So you occurs most in front of a, a verb. Okay. Sometimes in front of a noun, sometimes in front of an adverb, because it's modifying the verb. Right. And a little less everywhere else. So if I didn't know what you was, I should know now that it's at least some sort of noun. In this case, it's a pronoun. Okay. It's very difficult sometimes to distinguish between nouns and pronouns if you didn't know what they were because they act the same way. Fortunately, English is a very set list of pronouns. Okay. We don't have very many of them. So just one more example, and this one is more about ambiguity. Um, so one of the words can be multiple parts of speech. So not only can it have multiple meanings, it can be multiple parts of speech because those multiple parts of speech are different types of meanings sometimes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert to a lowercase with the tag in this NPS chat data set. So I'm going to lowercase the words just so that I get them all in the same format because it's a chat corpus. Sometimes people shout, so they're writing in uppercase. 
Now this is a little complicated, but we're going to loop over the words in our data. Okay, data here is the conditional frequency distribution. And conditions is the way that you get one of the columns out. So remember, conditional frequency distribution here is going to be each word by every tag that it has. So this is going to be like the word you is a pronoun. But the word that is a pronoun and a conjunction and a, a verb and adverb is not a verb, but um, um, uh, adjective, etc. So it has each word and all of its parts of speech. So conditions here is going to give us, let's like loop over each word. Um, or it might be loop over each part of speech here. I think it depends on what order you put them in. Yeah, words are going to be samples, dot samples. Parts of speech are going to be dot conditions because we did it word and then condition tag. <clears throat> so loop over that bad boy. You got to pick one of them, words or uh, samples or conditions. If that word, uh, the length of the uh, words set is more than three. So this is not the length of the word. This is the length of its set of, of um, tags. So remember, this is a conditional frequency distribution. So it's word by, or just look here, sorry, word by all of the types that it is. So the length here is actually counting determinant noun X and ADP. So there's four here, so that's why I got printed. Um, so if there's more than three parts of speech, so these are words that have four or more parts of speech. Loop over them and um, take the most common parts of speech. Basically, just like, save them okay? and and put them in order okay? um, as most common to least common, and then print them out. And here, let's go down. The word number two is in here a lot, but like, uh, damn, that's a funny one. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually considered like a weird part of speech. Most then an adjective, then a noun, then a verb. Okay. Back here is generally considered an adverb, then a noun, then something else, and then a particle. Okay. Like, so there are a bunch of words and slang here, like be, um, that are um, very ambiguous because there are four or more parts of speech. All right. Now that we've gotten into wrong way, sorry. Now we've gotten into working with complex data sets because this now becomes a complex data set, right? where we have um, a large conditional frequency distribution that has a, a key, the word, and then a, a set of objects that go with it. It's easier sometimes to work with dictionaries. Right? So dictionaries are a different type of object in Python. Um, we've mostly just been doing big old loops of lists and tuples. Uh, dictionaries are a bit more memory efficient, so they can um, search faster as the data set grows larger. And what happens is, is it's a key value pair. So you can think about this as a dictionary or a phone book, where each word or person has an entry, but you're only in there once. So each key can only occur once. And if you try to use a key more than once, it will overwrite. So let's say you saved the word and once and then tried to save it again, it just will overwrite the original entry. Um, but you're not limited on what's in the value. So the key uh, is also not really limited. It could be a tuple, but generally people stick with a word. Um, so you have a key, the key just cannot excuse me, the key has to be unique. The values do not. And the values can be anything. It can be a list. It can be a list of tuples. They can be um, a single tuple. It actually can be another dictionary, but that gets kind of hairy. So mostly people do keys and then lists or keys and then tuples or list tuples. Um, and so we might do something like word and it's part of speech or word and it's frequency. Or we could do word and then have a tuple set of part of speech and frequency. So we can get pretty complicated. And the way to notice them in Python specifically is that dictionaries have um, curly brackets. So lists are square brackets. 
tuples are regular parentheses, dictionaries are curly brackets. So when it prints them out, you can tell which type it is by either asking it what's the type, or you can look at what type of um, parentheses around it. There's a name for these, I can't remember what they're called. So let me just play around a little bit with dictionaries, and then we'll talk about how we're going to use them. As soon as I get my soda. magic sneaky soda here. So we're going to start a blank dictionary and we're going to call it part of speech. Okay. So curly brackets means empty dictionary. Throw some words in there. So the part of speech for Swiss is an adjective. Okay. Part, of, part of speech for cheese is a noun. Print that bad boy out. So here's our simple dictionary. Notice the way this looks. Right. So here's the key a colon, and then the value, and it just prints them all in order. Still there. Um, just the main focus here is just think about how this is different than a list. If I convert part of speech, which is a dictionary, to a list, check that out. That doesn't quite do what you expect it to do. Okay, you'd almost expect it to print either like this, okay, or as um, just four unique sets, like Swiss, now, uh, adjective, cheese, noun, but it doesn't. If you convert a dictionary into a list, it only prints the keys. So you could use dot keys to get the keys, dot values to get the values, or items, which is the pair of keys and values. And so that's actually the most handy thing, because now this converts a dictionary into a, a list of tuples, which we've worked with a lot. So each key can only have one entry, but that entry can have a lot of values. So we could do part of speech for well. The word well can be a noun, a verb, an adverb, and an adjective. And so we've got the whole set. This is a list. We could also make tuples of noun frequency, verb frequency, etc. So we can kind of nest some of this stuff. Now, the, the hard part about working with dictionaries is if a user runs into, or you, are trying to use a dictionary key that doesn't exist, it will blow up your code, and it won't run. So the easy thing to do is to create a default dictionary. And what a default dictionary does is it essentially says, if you run into something that doesn't exist, just add a spot for it to exist and um, leave that spot kind of open and waiting. So I'm going to make um, that my default for the dictionary is a list. Okay, This is on purpose. This is not the word list. This is the function list. So the default, if I don't know what it is, is to make it an empty list. You could set it to a specific value as well, like noun. So the part of speech here for well is a noun. So the first thing I did was part of speech 2 here. So part of speech, it's empty. Okay. Uh, it's a default dictionary where the default's a list and it's an empty dictionary. If I say, well, well is a noun, okay. you'll see here that it printed out that. But then if I tell it, hey, what's cheese? Okay. It'll add cheese, and here's the important part, it adds it as an empty list. This is super useful so that when people are running code in maybe a new um, data set, it doesn't explode. So why use dictionaries? We've been trucking along just fine with lists and tuples. Why are you introducing this new complicated thing? Right? And what they're useful for is they're faster, they're efficient. Um, because of the way they're stored in memory, they tend to run a little bit faster than lists of tuples. But then what we can do is now start thinking about, okay, what's this word? Here are all of its parts of speech. I don't have to create a conditional frequency distribution. I just have to do this once, plug it all in there. Here it is. We can look up all the 
all of the keys or the words with a specific part of speech value. I can look up uh, the lengths of how many times uh, each word has a specific part of speech. Like there's, it's much more efficient. So we'll use these off and on this semester. Um, so in in dictionaries, moving on. Uh, kind of a, a theory section here. As we are now talking, going to move into how do I build my own part of speech tagger? So let's say we're working with a language we've never seen, or um, you're working on a data set that doesn't follow traditional English rules. You want to write your own tagger. How do you do that? And the first thing we have to do is stop and go, how do I even know what a word's part of speech should be? Right? So I'm telling you it's noun phrase, verb phrase, noun phrase. How, how do I even know some of that? Right? Other than like the history of linguistics. There's three big areas, morphological cues, syntactic, and semantic cues. So let's look at each one of these in turn. Excuse me? All right, so what is a morpheme? Um, morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning in a word. So let's say if I have, um, if I know the word is cat, cats with an S, the S is an extra morpheme that indicates that there's more than one. So morphemes are not affixes, but uh, affixes are morphemes. Okay. So in the word cats, cat is a morpheme and the S is a morpheme. Because cat is the smallest unit of meaning, it, it is what it is, it's the animal, right? But the S adds this extra flavor of the meaning or an extra piece to it, meaning more than one. <clears throat> So what we see is that we can pull out uh, prefixes and suffixes and use those as cues to what a word's type should be because there are often um, certain suffixes or, or, or affixes in general that are tied to certain word types. For example, ing is um, a really good cue, it's a verb. Now it's not perfect because there are words like morning meaning early, that don't follow this rule, but a lot of times it's a good guess. Okay. LY is a very good clue for adverbs. However, S is very tricky. Many words end in S just because they do, um, or NESS, which is a different one, or IOUS, or, I, um, or S is plural, or, <laughs> one more, S is third person uh, present tense. I walk, you walk, they walk, he walks, English is them. Okay. So third person present tense and plurals are, are in competition for equally popular. Okay. Um, so I can't use the, the word ends in S very well usually. It's um, not the most distinctive, but that's a morphological cue, is what kind of suffix that it has can tell me what kind of word it is. I can then use syntactic cues, and this is the thing we've been talking about um, most of the lecture, whereas if it's a noun, if it's a verb, it's probably going to have a noun before it. Okay, so word order is very important in every language. Um, it is one of the strongest cues for word for sentence meaning. Um, and so we're going to call this grammatical slots, meaning there's a noun phrase and a verb phrase and a noun phrase. There's an order to things. And that slot is the, usually the strongest predictor of part of speech. Okay. And most part of speech taggers that are already built for us to use, like the POS tag function in an LTK, have used word order as its first rule to determine what the word should be. And then the last one that's a bit more tricky is semantic cues. And this is where um, you can kind of think about it as context clues. So I have a little uh, funny phrase, uh, sentence set down here from a paper that a student did as their honors thesis um, in my old job. And we were trying to figure out how people knew what, um, <clears throat> what uh, made up words meant. So braptus is a made up word. Okay. Uh, 
And so we has, we gave people the sentences, we asked them what the word meant, we gave them a multiple choice test, but then we asked them to pick what is the most, what word helped you distinguish what this word was? And so people would pick an individual word from uh, this set and that would tell, pe tell us like what they thought um, was the um, context, the strongest context clue. Okay. And what we find is that generally people will pick things that you might expect based on syntactic cues. So if the word should be a noun in this context, people will generally pick other nouns or adjectives. If the word is a verb, they will pick adverbs or nouns. And so um, generally a strong cue is a syntax. Um, but then often people will pick semantic clues. So a uh, semantic clue means it's based on the words around it and their meaning. Okay. Whereas a syntactic clue means it's only about the words, the word order. A semantic clue can be the kind of um, surrounding words and their, the, the definition of those words. Okay. This is much harder to program as a part of your tax tagger um, because words have multiple meanings and this can be very memory intensive uh, looking at all of the words around it because English is so flexible in the way we speak, um, combinations of word pairs become rare events and then you're trying to predict rare events which is really hard. So this is not programmed in uh, to many taggers just because it's so difficult to do. Are you okay over there? I thought my dog was about to, about to throw up or something. She was making a noise. Nope, just needed to readjust. All right. So, um, she's really funny because she's normally very quiet over here. Uh, but if I kick her out of the room, she'll sit and like kind of howl at the door. So she has to listen to me lecture. <laughs> um, so, uh, anyways, a little sidetrack here. Let's see if we can get, let's see, where do I want to stop? Oh my god, why? Why? <laughs> Default tagger, evaluation, yada, 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 yada. Okay, we'll do just a little bit more. Alright. <clears throat> so I can combine clues together um, thinking about um, the words around it and their meaning. Okay. Uh, but generally, most people pick morphos and tactic. So we're looking at the words around it, but also its morphemes to, especially to help tag the type of verb that it is. So I figured out if it's a verb, what type of verb is it? Well, now I can start using ing and that s rule. Okay. Uh, and so that really allows us to pull into these more fine-grained categories. We're not going to do a whole lot with this because it's more of a linguistics question. Um, but if a, let's say you're trying to write, um, you're trying to have a system that can match um, tenses. So you're trying to, uh, subject verb agreement is what I'm trying to go for. Um, and auxiliary verbs require you to know what tense it is. Uh, so this would be really handy if you had a part of speech tagger that could pull out tense. So for example, go, go is such an interesting word. Um, it's uh, base form or it's infinitive form, like to go, would be just be VB for verb. Goes is the third person singular present. That's really specific. That's things with like he, she, but almost nothing else. Right? They go, he goes, I go. So um, if you're trying to write a system that produces correct grammar, you have to know uh, that goes is your third person singular present. Z. Gone is our past participle. Um, went is our simple past. Okay, the difference between these two is I went, I have gone. Gone requires a auxiliary verb, so past participle. And going is our gerund uh, tense. So we, what we would do to label this is we'd look at what words were around it. That's the syntax part. And then what ending it has. So it has an S or an ING. 
to help us find grain categories. Now, went, since it is a, a regular past tense, it's not ed, you don't say I goed, uh, you would just have to know. Okay. So words that don't have normal conjugations are also stupid. <laughs> so you have to like program those in, um, usually. But the usefulness of fine grain categories really, again, depends on your goal. So if your goal is to um, write something that does proper grammar, super useful. If your goal is to think about what are the most popular combinations of words after um, a noun, not so useful. All right, so now we're going to build our own tagger. We're going to get started talking about building our own tagger, and we'll mostly get to it next week. So, um, and I'm going to do just a little bit more tonight, so next week we can also talk about the midterm. Um, so instead of taking a pre-tagged corpus, we can try to build our own tagger. And this is really where you're going to get to start to do some um, supervised learning, um, which is how classification works. So if you've taken the machine learning class, you'll get to see some things you've seen before. We're not going to do log regression, because most of our problems are bigger than that. Um, so uh, generally what we're going to do is tag at the sentence level because uh, we're going to do morphosyntactic rules and so you can't tag individual words because you need to know what the words are around it. So we're going to tag at the sentence level. And this is why everybody loves the brown corpus is because it's got information tagged at the sentence level. In PS chat you can't use quite so well because it doesn't have real sentences. What we can do now um, is take a gold standard, um, try ourselves to tag it, compare it to the answer, and see how well we did. So this is really where we're going to get into training and testing and talking about how you know if you've done well. Okay, basically, you can give yourself a score, percent correct. So from Brown. I'm going to pull out my tagged sentences. I'm going to use news, uh, again, just to keep kind of things a little bit different. But if I were wanting to apply this to generalize to a larger data set, I would want to use all of the categories. I wouldn't want to just only train it on news, because then my tagger works really well for news, but maybe not so well for hobbies. Okay. Um, so I've got the tagged sentences. Okay, so this is a, a, a list of tuples where each, it's a list of a list of tuples. <laughs> so each little mini list has the tuple pairs of word, part of speech, word, part of speech. And then this is just a list of lists where there, there's no parts of speech. Okay, so this is not tagged. And so how can we get started? Well, we could do something much like our regular expression rules where we just assign everything to be a noun. If you don't know, the best guess is frequency, but the second best guess is noun. That's obviously not going to be the best because nouns are only about a quarter of our language, but a quarter is a lot. Okay. Um, and so this is going to be handy after we kind of build our own part, our own tagger next week as the, the backup plan or our default. So if you've never seen a word before, the best guess is noun. All right, so to build a default tagger, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, train it. Okay. I'm going to use this, fun this word very loosely here because the training is uh, everything is a noun. Okay, there's no training based on a data set because the rule is just now, 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 now. Okay. So the training here is just give it a noun. Uh, function is default tagger. Okay. Here's the training set. It's all nouns. And once you've built this, now you can use it. So I can um, uh, use it here using the tag function. I'm going to see if, what it does when I look at the individual words for Brown. Okay, I'm not going to tag sentences. I'm just going to tag words here. Um, and it does exactly what we told it to do. Everything is labeled as a noun. How good is that? Right? So to evaluate, okay, the function here is evaluate, so tag 
applies the tagger to a new data set and um, gives you an answer, evaluate tells you how well you did. Okay, this is proportion correct. So one is perfect, zero is you got nothing right. And then our and then you put in here the to evaluate a tagged sentence set. And we only got 13% correct. So in the news corpus, 13% of those words are nouns. Okay, so we're not doing very well. This is maybe better than chance, because if there's 10, um, I think we're using the universal tag set. No, I didn't even use the universal tag set. So there's a ton of different types of tags um, in this brown corpus. I'd probably be better off using the universal tag set and making this noun. So let's do that real quick. Oh man, it doesn't like that. Tag set. Words got an unexpected keyword argument. Oh. Not there. There we go. So it calls everything noun. Noun, noun, noun. Uh, in the tagged sentences, I should have pulled it out as a universal tag set. So let me back up like five or six slides here. So tagged sentences. Let's see how much better we do. Oh, good grief. Targ set. Now you guys know I don't use live code. Universal. There we go. Okay, 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 okay. Let's see how much better. Wild guess, 25%. Oh, 30%. So 13% is tagged as NN, which is our original tag, and Brown has like a bazillion tags. There's somewhere where you can, I have a link somewhere where you can look up Brown tag set. Okay. Um, I think it's this page. How many different tags they have? Look at this nonsense. Okay. So there are a ton of tags, but NN is 13%. So we're actually doing really, way better than chance because there are so many different tags. Okay. All right, let me undo that lecture and we're going to be like, what was I doing here? If we use the universal tag set, uh, nouns would be 1 out of 10. And so we're doing way better than chance, which here uh, is 30%. Okay. 